what's going on, guys. We're going to be addressing the 9-11 Commission staff statements regarding intelligence, domestic intelligence reports in the summer of 2000, 2001. And what you'll see in the next 30 minutes is a slew of information that was not acted upon. Also, was a lot of information from the intelligence services, namely the NSA CIA, that was withheld from the FBI and as well as the federal government. And you, what I'll do is I'm going to fill in the blanks because even the 9-11 Commission states that there was an overwhelming amount of information regarding these key period of 2000, 2001, whereas in the same commission, you had CIA officials that were basically saying, you know, we, we, we didn't have enough information. So you, you could, you know, all these people in the truth movement that say, oh, the Night of the Commission is lying and stuff like that. Well, that's not necessarily the case all the time. So let's get right to it. This is going to be Philip Zelikow, the director, and Chris Kojim, and uh, two others. So here we go. We've built upon the substantial work carried out by the joint inquiry of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. We've obtained excellent cooperation from the CIA, the FBI, and the Office of Inspector General of the Department of Justice. They made significant material available for the preparation of this statement. I'd like to draw you now to page two of the statement, beginning with the spring of 2001, and turn the floor over to Chris Kojim, my deputy. In spring 2001, the level of reporting on terrorist threats and planned attacks began to increase dramatically, representing the most significant spike in activity since the millennium. At the end of March, the intelligence community disseminated a terrorist threat advisory, indicating there was a heightened threat of Sunni extremist terrorist attacks against U.S. facilities, personnel, and other interests in the coming weeks. That is before the release of the Phoenix Memo, right? That's the memo random written by Special Agent Ken Williams out of Phoenix. And where did this information come from? Well, it came from the Millennium Plot, right? You had a heightened alert regarding bin Laden wanting to attack the United States inside the states using aircraft. Now, this is the spring of 2001, where they still had time to give the Federal Aviation Administration and other federal agencies like the INS, uh, enough time to implement stricter security measures. Well, obviously that didn't happen, right? What, I mean, and you could go back to even the mid nineties when there was threat reports, threat matrix reports regarding threats to aviation in 96. This is the Pajinka plot, but this is rather recent. And this comes from the interrogation of Ahmed Rassam, who was a part of the millennium plot. And of course, in the summer of 2001, there were much more reports, including the presidential daily brief of August 6th, bin Laden to determined to strike inside the United States. Why didn't the local, state, and federal agencies take these warnings seriously? I, I don't know what to tell you because we had the warnings there. In April and May 2001, the drumbeat of reporting increased. Articles presented to top officials contained headlines such as, quote, bin Laden planning multiple operations, close quote. Quote, bin Laden public profile may presage attack, close quote. Quote, bin Laden networks plans advancing, close quote. By late May, there were reports of a hostage plot against Americans to force the release of prisoners including Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, right. the blind Sheikh, who was serving a life sentence for his role in the 1993 plot to blow up sites in New York City. The reporting noted that the operatives may opt to hijack an aircraft or storm a U.S. embassy. The reporting also mentioned that Abu Zubaydah was planning an attack and expected to carry out more if things went well. The U.S. government redoubled efforts, ongoing since late 1999, to capture Abu Zubaydah. And by the way, just to add, all right, this is 2004, as you can see by the date at the bottom, it's April 13, 2004. Two years later, the CIA would admit 
and this is in the Associated Press, would admit that Abu Zubaydah um, was not Al-Qaeda or a high-ranking member of Al-Qaeda, and that even after you know a couple of months of torture at CIA black sites, no real good information came from the torture of him. And, you know, the FBI, you know, they were the first to interview Abu Zubayd. In fact, Ali Soufan, an FBI agent out of New York City, who was a tutor under John O'Neill, counterterrorism, he was the first to reach Abu Zubayd, and he was getting somewhere with him. See, I heard about this, Tenet, the DCI, heard about this, and they he went to complain with Bush and said, we should take over the interrogation of, of Zubayd. And what they do? Well, they tortured him. Either the CIA is actually stupid and just ignorant of their own past history and regarding torture and it doesn't work, or there is a nefarious plot underway of torturing these people because of something that they might say or something that they might not say. Now, unfortunately, we don't know the answer to that because, uh, like I said in previous videos, even if People like Abu Zubaydah or Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or Ramzi bin Al-Shib or Taufik bin Atash or uh, Amr al or Mustafa al hasawi These are all people involved with the planning and alleged planning and logistical support for the 9-11 attacks. Even if they all told the truth, we won't know, right? Because they were tortured. So we'll, we're always stuck with, did they really tell you? Or, you know, was it all made up? We don't know. That's exactly where they want you. It's exactly where they want you. National Counterterrorism Coordinator Clark also called National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice's attention to possible plots in Yemen and Italy and by an, an alleged cell in Canada that might be planning an attack against the United States. Reports similar to these were made available to President Bush in morning meetings with DCI Tenet, usually attended by Vice President Cheney and National Security Advisor Rice as well. None of these reports mention that the attacks might occur in the United States. At the end of May, Counterterrorism Center Chief Kofer Black told Rice that the current threat level was a 7 on a scale of 10 as compared to an 8 during the millennium. The threat reports surged again. Now that's interesting because the CIA and the NSA already knew that two al-Qaeda operatives were inside the United States, Khalid al-Midar and Wapal Hazmi and that they were living in Los Angeles and then later San Diego. And this information was withheld from the FBI, right? So, and by default, the Department of State. Now, if you're the CIA and you think the attacks are happening abroad, yet you have two members of Al-Qaeda that just came from a high-level summit meeting in Malaysia of Al-Qaeda hierarchy and affiliates, you know, one plus one equals two. To, but to the CIA, it's one plus one equals 16, right? Nevertheless, I, like I said, either they're just stupid or something nefarious is afoot. Now, it's very well that the, the, you know, the theory is true that they were trying to turn these two guys to get uh, moles, spies inside Al-Qaeda. That was the goal in 99 when George Tenet told Kofor Black, the, the director of this counterterrorism center, to come up with a plan, which was nicknamed the plan, real ingenious title, uh, of getting contacts inside Al-Qaeda, because at that point, they didn't have any. All right? So it very well could be the case. But they involved the Saudis on their behalf because they don't have Arab linguists. And of course, you know, a CIA officer, field officer, is not going to really play the part well regarding being a Saudi or Arab fundamentalist. You can get Arab fundamentalists to do that, but you would have to involve Saudi General Intelligence Director, the intelligence arm, to become part of this operation, but we have to keep it secret. Well. That's not a theory anymore because with the Candace Trail document, as well as the FBI's Operation Encore files, we know this to be the case.
in June and July, reaching an even higher peak of urgency. A terrorist threat advisory in late June indicated that, that there was a high probability of near-term spectacular terrorist attacks resulting in numerous casualties. Headlines from intelligence reports were stark. Quote, bin Laden threats are real, close quote. Quote, bin Laden planning high-profile attacks, close quote. The intelligence reporting consistently described the upcoming attacks as occurring on a catastrophic level, indicating that they would cause the world to be in turmoil, consisting of possible multiple, but not necessarily simultaneous attacks. A late Look, this is... I, I, you have to stand in awe, right? The joint inquiry even states that Carl Levin, bless his heart, he read a detailed summary. It took him four minutes to give a timeline of intelligence warnings that were there starting in 96 to 2001 that Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, it was no secret. You know, the real conspiracy is that the intelligence services are telling you, oh, we didn't have the information. That's not what they're reading here, right? Congressional officials like Chris Okojim and Carl Levin, they're telling you, hey, this information was a wash. And it comes from the domestic services. Also in the summer of 2001, where Kojim is actually referring to as well in his statement, Foreign intelligence on top of it are telling you Italy, Canada, Germany, France, even Israel and Saudi Arabia. I mean, the, some of these reports are vague, but they're there. Hey, bin Laden's going to attack you. They're inside the country. They want to use planes as weapons. The conspiracy is this. There was so much information, but we didn't do anything with it. Name me a point in time where we had a five-year window where intelligence was stating that there is a threat to aviation in the United States by radical Arab fundamentalists. The essence of these threats are coming from bin Laden. Now, you had a number of daily threat reports and presidential meetings, which are basically principles meetings where members of the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, and local and federal uh, intelligence meet with the cabinet at the White House, and they talk about the current threat to national security. I, I, I don't know what to tell you, you know, whoever's watching this. For years, they had plans to kill bin Laden. And starting under the Clinton administration, yeah, that's right, Bill Clinton, the Clinton administration. And on the day of September 11, 2001, there's an audio of Bin Laden, of, of Clinton stating that I could have gotten Bin Laden, I could have killed him. But that means I could have killed a lot of people in Kandahar in Afghanistan. Well, heck, man, let's go back to 92, 93, where there was... Uh, a CIA field officer named Billy Waugh, who was living in uh, Africa. By the way, he was one of the few people that captured Carlos the Jackal, along with Kofor Black. Oh, Bin Laden, by the way, put a kill list on Kofor Black. Billy Waugh used to jog and act like a fitness instructor where Bin Laden lived in the Sudan. In Sudan. And he used to report back saying, I'm close enough where I could probably kill him. But it was rejected all the time. The CIA would go to, bin La uh, to Clinton in the principals meetings and basically hold these reports stating that we could kill uh, bin Laden in this manner, in this manner. No, they rejected all the time. I mean, even Michael Scheuer would come up with, you know, really outlandish uh, plots, including one where there was a meeting with bin Laden and Yemeni princesses, uh, princes, uh, princes in, um, in Kandahar, where they can actually drop a bomb because they didn't have drone strikes back then. It was just a new idea, drone strike, 96, 97. 
and nobody really wanted to do that. In fact, there was a there was a, a, a principals meeting where the CIA and and the Pentagon there was an argument in one instance where they were going to say, "Hey, why doesn't the CIA use this drone program to assassinate Bin Laden?" They said, "Well, we're not in the assassination business." Yeah, the CIA said this. Now that's coming from the pressure that the CIA was trying to repair under the Church hearings in 1977 where they brought to light all the nefarious assassination plots by the CIA. That all ended. Tenet came in, 97, I think, 96, he was uh, sworn in, wanted to reformat the CIA to more of a public, you know, a positive public view, trying to repair the image. Well, after 9-11, <laughs> wow, talk about an about face. So there was a lot of activity in 2001 where the information was not acted upon. June report stated that bin Laden operatives expect near-term attacks to have dramatic consequences of catastrophic proportion. Rice told us Clark and his counterterrorism and security group were the nerve center in coordinating responses, but that principals were also involved. In addition to his daily meetings with President Bush and weekly meetings to go over other issues with National Security Advisor Rice, Tenet continued his regular meetings with Secretary Powell and Secretary Rumsfeld. The foreign policy principals talked on the phone every day on a variety of subjects, including the threat. The summer threats seemed to be focused on Saudi Arabia, Israel, Bahrain, Kuwait, Yemen, and possibly Rome, but the danger could be anywhere, including a possible attack on the G8 summit in Genoa, where air defense measures were taken. Disruption operations were launched involving 20 countries. Several terrorist operatives were detained by foreign governments, possibly disrupting operations in the Gulf and Italy, and perhaps averting attacks against two or three U.S. embassies. U.S. armed forces in at least six countries were placed on higher alert. Units of the Fifth Fleet were redeployed. Embassies were alerted. Vice President Cheney contacted Crown Prince Abdullah to get more Saudi help. DCI Tenet phoned or met with approximately 20 top security officials from other countries. Deputy National Security Advisor Hadley apparently called European counterparts. Clark worked with senior officials in the Gulf. At Rice's request on July 5th, the CIA briefed Attorney General John Ashcroft on the Al-Qaeda threat, warning that a significant terrorist attack was imminent and a strike could, occ could occur at any time. That same day, officials from domestic agencies, including the Federal Aviation Administration, met with Clark to discuss the current threat. Rice worked directly with Tenet on security issues for the G8 summit. In addition to the individual reports, on July 11th, top officials received a summary recapitulating the mass of Al-Qaeda-related threat reporting on several continents. Tenet told us that in his world, quote, the system was blinking red, close quote. And by late July, it could not have been any worse. Tenet told us... Funny thing is that while all this is going on, the CIA and the NSA were withholding pertinent information. You already know what I'm talking about. Khalid al Madar and being inside the United States. They didn't tell nobody. Now, I mean, look, let me... Let me play another video for you, okay? Because, good Lord, all right, here we have a perfect example, and I mean a perfect example of the current, pro of the problem back in 2000, 2001, all right? Now, this is, this is coming from the joint inquiry, again. You've probably seen this video because I played it before. Now, this is Carl Levin, and he's just watch, All right? This is what I'm talking about. Now, with Chris Kojim, he's telling you that the CIA is meeting with, you know, the National Security Counterterrorism Czar, Richard Clark. He's meeting with National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. There's a threat about bin Laden and stuff. But the most important information the CIA is withholding, why? Well, let call Levin here um you know begin his inquiry and no that's not it you know here just I think we have to know
precisely, and perhaps we have to talk to the people other than the FBI agent who is here who confirms what our staff report says to the best of his knowledge. I think it is, this is such an important question that if there's any difference on this from the staff report, we should hear from the CIA. And I would ask our CIA officer who is here to take that request back and if there is a difference that that officer had recollection-wise uh, as to what happened at that meeting, whether or not she did in fact refuse to let the FBI know in June of 2001 why the CIA was tracking these two men. What? Why they didn't say at that time that we knew that these two men right. had visas to the United States. The FBI still didn't know that. That still wasn't on the watch list as of June of 2001. Now, this is 16 months after the CIA knew that these men had visas to come to the United States, months. had entered the United States. Still, according to our staff report, there is this refusal on the part of the CIA to share this information. Why? And this is right. critically important information. Oh, it's huge. I, I think that we've got to have accountability yeah, in this system. Great. And that failure is massive. And if that information should have been shared and should have been shared a lot earlier, and if watch lists should have been entered, and if FBI should have been notified, which it seems to me it's clear all that should have happened, then we've got to know who is responsible for those failures? We if know. We're going to really break down walls, real and imaginary. Yeah. You see, we already know now because it's years later. It's Wilshire, right? He's the deputy chief of Alex Station. Where's he getting his orders from? Richard Blade, the chief of station who took over in 99 over Michael Scheuer. That's where this is coming from. Now, this withholding of information comes from uh, the director. It has to. And Boy, how is this missed? The CIA is partly at fault here, and nobody got in trouble for it. Stunning. He Stunning. felt that President Bush and other officials grasped the urgency of what they were being told. On July 27th, Clark informed Rice and Hadley that the spike in signals intelligence about a near-term attack had stopped. He urged keeping readiness high during the August vacation period, warning that another report suggested an attack had just been postponed for a few months. On August 3rd, the intelligence community issued a threat advisory warning that the threat of impending al-Qaeda attacks would likely continue indefinitely. The advisory cited threats in the Arabian Peninsula, Jordan, Israel, and Europe, and suggested that al-Qaeda was lying in wait and searching for gaps in security before moving forward with the planned attack. Notice it's all outside the United States, the warnings. It's not inside the United States. Meanwhile, the threat is brewing inside the United States. Tax. Man. During the spring and summer of 2001, President Bush had occasionally asked his briefers whether any of the threats pointed to the United States. Reflecting on these questions, the CIA decided to write a briefing article summarizing its understanding of this danger. The article which the president received on August 6th, is attached to this staff statement. Despite the large number of threats received, there were no specifics regarding time, place, method, or target. Right. Disru Listen. Disruption efforts continued. An al-Qaeda associate from North Africa connected to Abu Zubaydah was arrested in the United Arab Emirates on August 13th. He had apparently been planning an attack against the U.S. Embassy in Paris. CIA analysts who have recently reviewed the threat surge of the summer of 2001 told us they believe it may have been related to a separate stream of events. These threats may have been referring to the 9-11 attack, the planned assassination of Northern Alliance leader Ahmed Shah Massoud, or other operations. In July 2001, the CSG alerted federal law enforcement agencies and asked the FAA to send out security advisories. Beginning on July 27th, the FAA issued several security directives to U.S. air carriers prior to September 11th. In addition, the FAA issued a number of general warnings about potential threats, primarily overseas, to civil aviation. None of this is another problem regarding this insistence 
that there is a, a threat to civil aviation overseas. Now, again, you know, the joint inquiry states that the threat, which was a report coming from the Bajinka plot, was basically coming from the intelligence of the Philippines telling you that there's a threat not overseas, but inside the United States. We were watching for and and again, I, you know, me and Sean went over this uh, together in a great collab I have with him. Go watch that video. And we played this video. I'll, I'll show you. Look, this is the same, you know, this is the joint inquiry again, where it's contradictory to what Chris Kojim is stating, right? The CIA, you know, the CIA is saying, oh, the threat and the FAA, by the way, I'm sorry, not the CIA, the FAA is saying the threat is overseas. This is where that report is coming from. Here, listen. We're watching for something happening overseas. Let me, let me deal into that a little bit. Bajinka happens in 95. FAA sent somebody over to Manila. Are you familiar with that? Are you familiar with the FAA sending a representative over to Manila? Yes. And, and what did they come back and say? What did, that, what did that person report after going over to Manila and finding out that a member of Al-Qaeda was going to hijack 12 American airplanes in a suicide fashion? I've got to get both words in here because you all say, geez, I didn't think they could commit suicide. There were 10 attacks right. by Al-Qaeda against the United States from 1992 to 2001, and nine of them were suicide. We knew by then that bin Laden was going to come after the United States. So what did the guy report when he came back in 1995? What did he tell you? And what was your response to it? Well, my recollection, and I do not have a specific recollection of what was said, but my general recollection was that the threat at that time, and continued up through September 11, was really directed outside the borders of the United States. In 1998, after the East African Embassy bombing Mr. Belger, it was in the newspaper that the, that the United States of America federal government arrested two suspects that were in the United States. One in, one in California, one in, in Texas. Ali Muhammad and Wadi al -Hud. Why would you reach that conclusion that they were only going to attack outside the United States? The conclusion I reached, sir, was based on the, the, the intelligence information that was given to me. Yeah, and I mean, I can't... That be any more I'm talking about stuff that's clear. reported in the newspaper yeah. okay where did that report come from it came from the CIA because <laughs> we go back to what Mark Rossini who is an FBI agent out of New York who worked as a liaison officer at the CIA's virtual station uh, Bin Laden issue station Cody Malik station what does he say when they saw the the, the central intelligence report about Khalid al Badar al Fahadmi inside the United States well he says that when they tried to, to write a draft report warning headquarters about them inside the United States, a CIA analyst named Michelle Ann Casey told Marco Cini not to share that information because we think the next attack is Southeast Asia. So that's where this essence of this threat to Southeast Asia comes from. And that information was shared to DFA. Now, Monty Belger ain't lying. Meanwhile, we have a connection that the CIA knew about, as well as the NSA, that two Al-Qaeda operatives, both Khalid al and Wafa Hasmi, left Malaysia to Bangkok inside the United States. Why would they think the next attack is in Southeast Asia when you have two members of Al-Qaeda inside the United States that came from a Malaysia summit meeting that were most likely, according to intelligence support, that they were talking about the 9-11 operation. Now, it very well could be that the CIA speculated about the attacks in Southeast Asia because that's where the meeting was held, that they don't know specifics. It very well could be the case. That they didn't know, but we don't know because they're withholding information. If they withheld information from the FBI, as well as the federal government, I wonder what, how much information they are withholding. Now, as well 
as the foreign intelligence units that were operating inside the United States. This is what's not covered in the 9-11 Commission or the Joint House Inquiry, even though they both received copies of the Gerald Shea Memorandum with the Israelis monitoring everybody. The Saudis were at least monitoring Khalid al Madar, Nawab Azmi, and later Hani Hanjour. The Israelis had everybody. They had everybody. Even the FBI, even the DEA, and other government buildings that they were surveilling. There was over 200 people involved. And they lived right next door to all the 9-11 hijackers. Hi, 9-11 Truth Movement. That's right. The hijackers you don't believe in, all these people don't exist. These operations don't exist either. Thanks. You're a big help. So what specifics do they have? Well, they probably have the mother load. And you can manipulate an operation by knowing the operation beforehand. So, you know, there's your problem, is that Again, the CIA is right in the middle of it. These warnings required the implementation of additional aviation security measures. They urged air carriers to be alert. Although there was no credible evidence of an attack in the United States, Clark told us, the CSG arranged for the CIA to brief senior intelligence and security officials from the domestic agencies. The head of counterterrorism at the FBI, Dale Watson, said he had many discussions about possible attacks with Kofor Black at the CIA. They had expected an attack on July 4th. Watson said he felt deeply that something was going to happen. But he told us the threat information was nebulous. He wished he had known more. He wished he had had, quote, 500 analysts looking at Osama bin Laden threat information instead of two, close quote. Rice and Hadley told us that before September 11th, they did not feel they had the job of handling domestic security. They felt Clark and the CSG were the National Security Council's bridge between foreign and domestic threats. In late August, working level CIA and FBI officials realized that one or more Al Qaeda operatives might be in the United States. Mm. We have found no evidence that this discovery was ever briefed to the CSG, to principals, or to senior counterterrorism officials at the FBI or the CIA. Nor was the <laughs> that's because the NSA and the CIA withheld that information from you. And nobody was ever held accountable for it. Now, if you really wanted to hold these people's feet to the fire, why didn't the 9 11 Truth Movement do this earlier? Because they told you, people like David Ray Griffin and Alex Jones and Jason Burmis and Barbara Honiger, they all told you the 9-11 Commission is a lie. So that means that you didn't even bother reading the report or watching videos like this where you would have caught on certain people within the intelligence services domestically, specifically the CIA, in perjury, which is what George Tenet did twice, in the Joint House Inquiry, and also to the Night Limit Commission once. You would have had people like Tom Wilshire, the deputy director of Alex Station, basically lying as well. And they all, like Kofor Black, when they were interviewed, you know, they all gave conflicting accounts about, oh, intelligence was shared. Oh, well, some information was shared. Well, no. You intentionally withheld information while telling the FAA and the principals that we think the next attack's in Southeast Asia. The White House told about the arrest of Zacharias Musawi. We investigated awareness of the terrorist threat within the Department of Justice and the FBI during the spring and summer of 2001. Rice told us that she believed the FBI had tasked its 56 U.S. field offices to increase surveillance of suspected terrorists and to reach out to informants who might have information about terrorist plots. 
An NSC document at the time described such a tasking having occurred in late June, although it does not indicate whether the tasking was generated by the NSC or the FBI. At this point, we have found the following. On April 13th, FBI headquarters alerted field offices to a heightened threat from al-Qaeda against U.S. interests. The, com the communication detailed the threats against U.S. interests abroad, but made no mention of any possible threat inside the United States. Mm -hmm. The field offices were asked to, quote, task all resources to include electronic databases and human sources for any information pertaining to the current operational activities relating to Sunni extre extremism, close quote. On July 2nd, the FBI Counterterrorism Division sent a message to federal agencies and state and local law enforcement agencies that summarized information regarding threats against U.S. interests from bin Laden. The message reported that there was an increased volume of threat reporting, indicating a potential for attacks against U.S. targets abroad from groups aligned with or sympathetic to Osama bin Laden. Like it further stated, that. quote, the FBI has no information indicating a credible threat of terrorist attack in the United States, close quote. However, and it went on to emphasize... because the FBI didn't have the necessary information from its own uh, compatriots in the intelligence community, specifically the NSA and CIA. ...that the possibility of attack in the United States could not be discounted. It also noted that the July 4th holiday might heighten the threats. The report asked the recipients to, quote, exercise vigilance, close quote, and, quote, report suspicious activities, close quote, to the FBI. Acting FBI Director Thomas Picard recently told us that during his summer telephone calls with special agents in charge of each FBI field office, he mentioned to each the heightened threat among other subjects. He also told us that he had a conference call with all special agents in charge on July 19th, in which one of the items he mentioned was that they needed to have their evidence response teams ready to move at a moment's notice in case they needed to respond to an attack. We found in our field office visits last fall, however, that a number of FBI personnel, with the exception of those in the New York field office, did not recall a heightened sense of threat from Al Qaeda within the United States in summer 2001. For example, an international terrorism squad supervisor in the Washington field office told us that he was neither aware in summer 2001 of an increased threat, nor did his squad take any special steps or actions. The special agent in charge of the Miami field office told us he did not learn of the high level of threat until after September 11th. Mm. Mm. Picard said in late June and through July he met with Attorney General Ashcroft once a week. He told us that although he initially briefed the Attorney General regarding these threats, after two such briefings, the Attorney General told him he did not want to hear this information anymore. The Justice Department has informed us that Attorney General Ashcroft, his former deputy, and his chief of staff deny that the Attorney General made any such statement to Picard. Ashcroft told us that he asked Picard whether there was intelligence about attacks in the United States. Picard said he replied that he could not assure Air Ashcroft that there would be no attacks in the United States, although the reports of threats were related to overseas targets. Ashcroft said he therefore assumed that the FBI was doing what it needed to do. He acknowledged that, in retrospect, this was a dangerous assumption. Prior to 9-11, neither Ashcroft nor his predecessors received a copy of the President's Daily Brief. After 9-11, Ashcroft began to receive portions of the brief that relate to counterterrorism. It is in this context that we return to the story of Midhar and Hazmi. While top officials in Washington were receiving and reacting to various threat reports, we need to step further down in the bureaucracy to trace a now significant story of how particular Al-Qaeda associates were addressed by lower level officials. In staff statement number two, presented at our January hearing, we discussed the complex story of successes and failures in tracking and identifying hijackers Khalid al-Midhar, Nawaf al-Hazmi, Nawaf's brother Salim al-Hazmi, and the coal bomber Khalad. Those efforts had trailed off in January 2000. 
No one at CIA headquarters reacted to the March 2000 cable from Bangkok that someone named Nawaf El Hazmi had traveled to the United States. But That's not true. And, you know, it's, this is tiring as fuck. They knew they were inside the United States. They withheld this information intentionally. I keep saying it time and time again. How many times do we have to say it? There is a concerted effort in the CIA to withhold information regarding Khalid al Bidar and the Wafal Hazmi inside the United States. Again, let's go back to the joint inquiry. Carl Levin, once again, just to show you, without me telling you, again, there was an intentional withholding of information. This is coming from the CIA's own man, Clark Shannon. That's who Carl Levin is referring to in this video as the analyst. Let's hear it. And here's where I want to pick up with our witnesses. The CIA analyst who attended the New York meeting acknowledged to the joint inquiry staff that he had seen the information regarding Al Midar's U.S. visa and Al Hazmi's travel to the U.S., but he stated that he would not share information outside of the, S of the CIA unless he had authority to do so and unless that was the purpose of the meeting. Oh. Now, Again. June 11th, New York. The second meeting. Now we've got the FBI asking the CIA, would you tell us why you're following these two guys? Why? And according to the CIA analyst, to our staff, that information was denied because no authority oh. to do so unless that's the purpose of the meeting so I, okay. I i don't need to go further with you this is the cia's own words and you know carl levin would ask george Tennant about this issue and he says that you know hey we interviewed your man and he basically told us one thing and you're saying another and George said, is saying, yeah. So he told you, and he told us something different. That's what Carl Levin said. And George says, like, tongue-tied. Well, you know. Because the CIA is withholding from everybody about an illegal operation inside the United States, along with Saudi intelligence, and monitoring Khalid al and Wab Azmi. But everybody who's watched my video knows this. There were three episodes in 2001 when the CIA and or the FBI had apparent opportunities to refocus on the significance of Hazmi and Midhar and reinvigorate the search for them. As in the 2000 story, the details are complex. We turn to the first episode, which is in January 2001, the identification of Khalad. Almost one year after the original trail had been lost in Bangkok, the January 2000 rendezvous of suspected terrorists in Kuala Lumpur resurfaced. The FBI and the CIA learned from a conspirator in the USS Cole attack in Yemen that a person he knew as Khalad had helped direct the Cole bombing. One of the members of the FBI's investigative team in Yemen realized he had previously heard of Khalad from a joint FBI-CIA source who had said Khalad was close to bin Laden. Khalad was also linked to the East Africa bombings in 1998. The FBI agent obtained from a foreign government a photo of the person believed to have directed the Cole bombing. The joint source confirmed the man in that photograph was the same Khalad he had described. In December 2000, based on some analysis of information associated with Khalid al-Midhar, the CIA's bin Laden station speculated that Khalad and Khalid al-Midhar might be one and the same. So, the CIA asked that a Kuala Lumpur surveillance photo of Midhar be shown to the joint source who had already identified an official photograph of Khalad. 
Well, uh, wait a minute. Hold <laughs> boy, oh boy. The CIA had a had a contact inside the NSA's operation of the Yemen hub, right? Now, the analyst is saying that the NSA heard a phone call in December of 99 between Khalid and Khalid. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you this. How did the CIA say that Khalid and Khalid were the same meeting? Were they fucking talking to each other? They're lying their fucking ass off. Lying themselves during the commission. And the truth movement will tell you, did you know a third building fell? The legacy media in this country, a bunch of fucking frauds that they are, well, they're not going to air this. Hell, they don't want to, you know, disrupt the apple cart because who controls the media? Well, a number of different, you know, entities, one of them being the CIA. What do you think Operation Mockingbird ended like this? Take a look at TV today. It's even worse than it was 10 years ago. When talk about manipulation, psychological operations, look at your average voter. That's all I have to say. Look at what constitutes the left and the right, even though they're two parts of a wing of the same bird. And when they realize that there is no left and right, maybe they'll get an idea. But the CIA is even lying. Because they knew from an analyst close to the NSA that Khalid, who's calling from Malaysia, is talking to Khalid, who's in Yemen. In early January 2001, two photographs from the Kuala Lumpur meeting were shown to the joint source. One was a known photograph of Midhar, the other a photograph of an unknown subject. The joint source did not recognize Midhar but he indicated he was 90% certain that the other individual was Kalad. This meant that Kalad and Midhar were two different people, but the fact that both had attended the meeting in Kuala Lumpur also meant there was a link between Kalad, a suspected leader in the coal bombing, yep. the Kuala Lumpur meeting, and Midhar. Despite this new information, we found no effort by the CIA to renew the long abandoned search for Midhar or his travel companions. Because they knew where they In were addition, going. we found that the CIA because, did now, not notify. Let me add some context to that because the CIA did, did, was not known to the commission, right? It's 2004. But because of the counter Australia documents and the latest revelations, we now know that the CIA was running an illegal operation with the Saudis. So when, they, when the CIA said they lost him in Bangkok, the CIA held a meeting, a principal's meeting. Rich Blee, who is the chief of Alex Station, said that, hey, we lost al Bidon and Al-Hazmi in Bangkok. We don't know where they are. What happened was, from Bangkok, al Bidon and Al-Hazmi went to the United States. Who was directly meeting them? The Saudis. Fahad al-Tamari, Omar al-Bayoumi, okay? Who's operating this whole operation? the Islamic Affairs Attaché in Washington, D.C., Muasad al-Jar, who's actually named in the Operation on Court File. He's the one who gave Fahad al-Tamari the imam position at the King Fab Mosque, and he also has connections with al-Qaeda and Islamic terrorist organizations. That's the FBI saying this. Omar al-Bayoumi is acting as the logistical and financial coordinator between al and al-Hazmi. He got them an apartment in San Diego told them to go from Los Angeles to San Diego. The first two weeks, al Midar and Al-Hazmi stood at a hotel paid for by Fahad Al-Tamari. This is all related in the Operation Encore file. That, and the CIA knew this because they were running a joint operation, which means that they were acting, operating illegally inside the United States. This is the reason why they withheld information from the FBI. By the FBI of this identification until late August. DCI Tennant and Kofer Black testified before the joint inquiry that the FBI had access to this information from the beginning. They're lying. But based on extensive record, including documents that were not available to the CIA personnel who drafted that testimony, 
we conclude they were in error. The FBI's no, primary coal investigators. They Barbara, Barbara here. Yeah. They weren't in error. They lied. They fucking lied. That's it. Call for what it is. And it, I mean, Carl Levin even states it from the interview of its own CIA analyst that he would not share this information regarding Al Hazmi and Al Midar being inside the United States unless he had authority to do so. Where's that authority coming from? The DCI. It's not coming from Black. It's not coming from the director of operations, James Pavitt. It's not coming from Tom Wilshire acting as a lone wolf. This is coming from the CIA's own director who has the authority. Had no knowledge of Khalid's possible participation in the Kuala Lumpur meeting until after the September 11 attacks. This is an example of how day-to-day -day gaps in information sharing can emerge even in a situation of goodwill on all sides. The information was from a joint FBI-CIA source. The source spoke essentially no English. The FBI person on the scene overseas did not speak the languages the source right. spoke. The Due to CIA travel and security did. issues, the amount of time spent with the source was necessarily kept short. As a result, the CIA officer usually did not simultaneously translate either the questions or the answers for his accompanying FBI colleague and friend. That's right, because the CIA officer knows exactly what this person was saying, Fahad al Kusa. That's who's in the room with them. And he is saying that in the picture is Kalat, but that's not what the CIA case officer is telling the FBI. Why? Why? The fuck is going on? For interviews without such simultaneous translation, the FBI agent on the scene received copies of the reports that the CIA disseminated to other agencies, but he was not given access to the CIA's internal operational traffic that contained more detail. Why? The information regarding the January 2001 identification of Kalad was only reported in operational traffic, to which the relevant FBI investigators did not have access. The CIA officer does not recall this particular identification no, and thus cannot say why it was not shared with his FBI colleague. But he may have misunderstood the possible significance of no, the new identification. No. Midhar left the United States in June 2000. It is possible that if in January 2001, agencies had resumed their search for him or placed him on the tip-off watch list, they might have found him before or at the time Midhar applied for a new visa right. in June 2001. Right. Or they might have been alerted to him when he returned to the United States the following month. We cannot know. The second opportunity is in the spring of 2001, looking again at Kuala Lumpur. By mid-May 2001, as the threat reports were surging again, a CIA official detailed to the International Terrorism Operations Section at the FBI Tom wondered Wilson. where the attacks might occur. We will call him John. John recalled the Kuala Lumpur travel of Midhar and his associates around the millennium. By the way, the, he same, searched Tom, the, the same Tom Wilshire who told Michelle and Casey to tell the FBI analysts on as acting as liaison officers at Alex Station, Doug Miller and Mark Rossini, to not to not share this information with FBI headquarters regarding Al Midar and Hazmi having dual US visas and being inside the United States. Now he's working as a liaison officer for the US's coal bombing investigation at the FBI. You couldn't you couldn't make this up. Now, is he really there for that? Or is he trying to act as a fish, right? He's trying to hear, chatter, whether the FBI knows about al Hazmi and al Minar inside the United States. That very well could be the case as well. Well, he's working U.S.'s cold case because the U.S.'s cold case has the, 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 the three men that were at the Malaysia summit meeting that is very, that is very much 
uh, on the FBI's radar. Khalid, Taufik Bidatash, Khalid Amidar, and Wafa Hazmi. Because if the FBI makes that connection, they don't have to open an intelligence operation. There's a criminal investigation. That means that if Al Midar and Al Hazmi were located inside the United States, the FBI can arrest them. And that's not what the CIA wants because they're running a joint operation with the Saudis regarding monitoring both of those men. Or is it something more? We don't know. CIA's databases for information regarding the travel. On May 15th, he and another official at CIA re-examined many of the old cables from early 2000, including the information that Midhar had a U.S. visa and that Hazmi had come to mm. Los Angeles on January 15, 2000. The CIA official who reviewed the cables took no action regarding these cables. She cannot recall this work. John, however, began a lengthy exchange with a CIA analyst to figure out what these cables meant. He recognized the relationship to the bombing case, and he was aware that someone had identified Khalad in one of the surveillance photographs from the Malaysia meeting. He concluded that something bad was definitely up. Really? Despite the U.S. links evident in this traffic, John did not raise that aspect with his FBI counterparts. He was focused on Malaysia. John's focus on the overseas target area might be understood from his description of the CIA as an agency that tended to play a zone defense. In contrast, he said, the FBI tends to play man to man. Desk officers at the CIA's bin Laden station did not have cases in the same sense as an FBI agent who works something beginning to end. Thus, when the trail went cold after the Kuala Lumpur meeting in January 2000, the desk officer moved on to different things. By the time the March 2000 cable arrived with information that one of the travelers had flown to Los Angeles, the case officer was not responsible for following up on that information. While several individuals at the bin Laden station opened the cable when it arrived in yeah. March 2000. Right? Even though they knew that both member of Al-Qaeda, they're inside the United States. Eh, let it pass. I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> 2000, it was no one's concern and no action was taken. Hmm? We discussed yeah, some of the management issues raised by this in January in staff statement number two. The CIA's zone defense concentrated on where, not who. Had its information been shared with the FBI, a combination of the CIA's zone defense and the FBI's man-to-man -man approach might have been far more productive. Yes. The third opportunity is in August 2001, when the search for Hazmi and Midhar begins and fails. During the summer of 2001, John asked an FBI official detailed to the CIA to review all of the Kuala Lumpur materials Barbara one more time. That's we will call her Mary. He Welcome. asked her to do the research in her free time. She began her work on July 24th. That day, she found the cable reporting that Midhar had a visa to the United States. A week later, she found the cable reporting that Midhar's visa application, what was later discovered to be his first application, listed New York as his destination. On August 21st, but she located the March 2000 cable that noted with interest that Hazmi had flown to Los Angeles in January 2000. She grasped the significance of this information. Yeah. Mary okay. and an FBI analyst working the case, whom we will call Jane, promptly met with an INS representative at FBI headquarters. On August 22nd, INS told them that Midhar had entered the United States on January 15, 2000, and again on July 4, 2001. Now the jig is up. Jane and Mary also learned that there was no record that Hazmi had left since January 2000 but they were not certain if he was still here and assumed that he had left with Midhar in June 2000. They decided that if Midhar was in the United States, he should be found. They divided up the work. Mary asked the bin Laden station to draft a cable requesting that Midhar and Hazmi be put on the tip-off watch list. Jane took responsibility for the search effort inside the United States. As the information indicated that Midhar had last arrived in New York, 
and this was determined to be related to the bin Laden case in New York, she began drafting a lead for the FBI's New York field office. She called an agent in New York to give him a heads up on the matter, but her draft lead was not sent until August 28th. Her email told the New York agent that she wanted to get him started on this as soon as possible, but she labeled the, the lead as routine. A routine designation the informs the receiving office it has 30 days to respond to the lead. Right. The agent who received the lead forwarded it to a squad supervisor. That same day, the supervisor forwarded the lead to an intelligence agent to open an intelligence case. He criminal. also sent it to the coal case agents and an agent who had spent significant time in Malaysia searching for another Khalid, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. The suggested goal of the investigation was to locate Midhar, determine his contacts and reasons for being in the United States, and possibly conduct an interview. Before sending the lead, Jane had discussed it with John, the CIA official on detail to the FBI, and with the acting head of the FBI's bin Laden unit. The discussion apparently was limited to whether the search should be classified as an intelligence investigation or as a criminal one. A legally important distinction for reasons we explained earlier today in staff statement number nine. And how Neither could of these this individuals have been a criminal investigation if the CIA basically told the FBI that we have information that Khalid al Minar and Wapa Hasmi were seen with Khalid, the alleged mastermind of the coal bombing, and that they were not only seen together, but they were seen together at a high level Al Qaeda meeting, would have been a criminal investigation. When? January of 2000. That would have ended 9-11, or part of it. At least part of it. Apparently disagreed with the analyst's proposed plan. No one apparently felt they needed to inform higher levels of management in either the FBI or the CIA about the case. One of the Cole case agents read the lead with interest and contacted Jane to obtain more information. Jane took the position, however, that because the agent was a designated criminal agent, the wall kept him from participating in any search for Midhar. In fact, she felt he had to destroy his copy of the lead because it contained information she believed could not be shared with any criminal agents. The joint inquiry covered the details of their heated exchanges, and we will not repeat them here. The result was that criminal agents who were knowledgeable about the coal and experienced with criminal investigative techniques, including finding suspects and possible criminal charges, were excluded from the search. Many witnesses have suggested that even if Midhar had been found, there was nothing the agents could have done except follow him onto the planes. We believe this is incorrect. Both Hazmi and Midhar could have been held for various immigration violations or as material witnesses in the coal bombing case. Investigation or interrogation of these individuals and their travel and financial activities also may have yielded evidence of connections to other participants in the 9-11 plot. Right. In any case, the opportunity did not arise. Notably, the lead did not draw any connections between the threat reporting that had been coming in for months and the presence of two possible Al-Qaeda operatives in the United States. Moreover, there is no evidence that the issue was substantively discussed at any level above a deputy chief of a section within the counterterrorism division at FBI headquarters. The search was assigned to one FBI agent for whom this was his very first counterterrorism lead. By the terms of the lead, he was given 30 days to open an intelligence case and make some unspecified efforts to locate Midhar. He started the process a week later. He checked local New York indices for criminal record and driver's license information and checked the hotel listed on Midhar's U.S. entry form. Now, this on is September where, 11, the now, agent... Look, it, this is where if the CIA put Khalid Al-Bidhar and Wapal Hasmi on the tip book database that this agent would have found them where they were, you know, his history, how he got in the United States. And granted, you know, we're talking about less than two weeks before the attacks. At least it would have been something. Again, another failure on the CIA. Send a lead to Los Angeles based on the fact that Midhart had initially arrived in Los Angeles in January 2000. Time had run out on the search. 
We want to briefly mention two other incidents in the summer of 2001. The first, the Phoenix Memo. The Phoenix Memo was investigated at length by the Joint Inquiry. We recap it briefly in the statement that's provided to you. I just want to mention now, as its author told us, the Phoenix Memo was not an alert about suicide pilots. His worry was more about a Pan Am 103 scenario in which explosives were placed on an aircraft. The memo's references to aviation training were broad, including electronics and aircraft maintenance. And lastly, Masawi. On August 15, 2001, the Minneapolis FBI field office initiated an intelligence investigation on Zacharias Musawi. He had entered the country on February 23, 2001 and began flight lessons at Airman Flight School in Oklahoma City. He began flight training at the Pan American Flight Training School in Minneapolis on August 13. Musawi had none of the usual qualifications for flight training on Pan Am's Boeing 747 flight simulators. Contrary to popular belief, Masawi did not say he was not interested in learning how to take off or land. Instead, mm. he stood out because with little knowledge of flying, he wanted to learn or take off and land a Boeing 747. The FBI agent who handled the case in conjunction with the INS representative on the Minneapolis Joint Terrorism Task Force suspected Masawi of wanting to hijack planes. Because Masawi was a French national, who had overstayed his visa, he was detained by the INS. The FBI agent sent a summary of his investigation to FBI headquarters on August 18. In his message, he requested assistance from the FBI field office in Oklahoma City and from the FBI legal attache in Paris. Each of these offices responded quickly. By August 24th, the Minneapolis agent had also contacted a detailee from the FBI and a CIA analyst at the Counterterrorist Center about the case. DCI Tennant was briefed about the Masawi case. He told us no connection to Al-Qaeda was apparent to him before 9-11. Masawi had lived in London, so the Minneapolis agent also requested assistance from the legal attache in London. The legal attache promptly prepared a written request to the British government for information concerning Masawi and hand-delivered the request on August 21st. He informed the British of developments in the case on September 4th. The case, although handled expeditiously at the American end, was not handled by the British as a priority amid a large number of other terrorist-related inquiries. On September 11th, after the attacks, the legal attaché renewed his request for information. After 9-11, the British government, in response to U.S. requests, supplied some basic biographical information about Massawi. The British government has informed us that it also tasked intelligence collection facilities for information potentially relating to Massawi. On September 13th, the British received new sensitive intelligence that Massawi had attended an Al-Qaeda training camp in Afghanistan. And by the way, what training camp was that? Khaldeen. Same training camp where Ahmed Bassam was at. Now, Moussaoui had connections to Islamic fundamentalists in France. One such individual named Abu Hamza, who has a hook for a hand, he's currently doing life in the United States prison. I don't know where he is now, but um, that was enough for a FISA warrant to be approved. Now, there was some argument between Minneapolis FBI headquarters and the FISA courts because the FISA officers of Minneapolis had an argument with Harry Samet, the agent who arrested Musawi, about the legal definitions outlined in the FISA warrant. Needless to say that they couldn't look at Musawi's laptop or his possessions in his hotel room. Why? Because he's not an American citizen. And if he was an American citizen, we would just need a warrant, right, by a court. But because he's a foreign national, we need to show the connection between Musawi and radical fundamentalism. And as Barbara Gruy says here, that that information was shared by British intelligence, which got information from the French. That was known to Minneapolis. And even still with that information, they rejected the FISA warrant. Now, Colleen Rowley, who I've interviewed, 
basically would write a scathing letter to director Robert Mueller stating that there was a high level of malfeasance on behalf of the um, the radical fundamentalist unit under Bob Bowman and Dave Frasca, who had a huge disagreement with Harry Samet over the uh, wording definitions of the Pfizer war. On September 11, 2001, because the attacks happened, then they went through Masawi's laptop. You can't make this stuff up. It passed this intelligence to the United States that same day. Had this information been available in late August 2001, the Masawi case would almost certainly have received intense and much higher level attention. <laughs> Prior to 9-11, there was a continuing dispute between FBI agents in Minneapolis and supervisors at headquarters about whether evidence had been sufficient to seek a FISA warrant to search Massawi's computer hard drive and belongings. After 9-11, the FBI learned that Millennium Terrorist Rassam, who was cooperating with investigators, could have recognized Massawi from the Afghan camps. Either the British information or the Rassam identification would have broken that logjam. A maximum U.S. effort to investigate Massawi could conceivably have unearthed his connections to the Hamburg cell, though this might have required an extensive effort with help from foreign governments. The publicity about the threat also might have disrupted the plot, but this would have been a race against time. Uh, to close up, Commissioners, uh, the remainder of the statement covers three other topics, which we will not try to deliver orally here. The first of those is information issues. We itemize in our statement five information issues that are lessons that we have gathered from this story. Second, we offer a preliminary finding on a post-9-11 events. We offer our preliminary findings on the flights of Saudi nationals leaving the United States after 9-11, which has been a focus of some public attention. And finally, as part of the issues of threat and response in 2001, we described some of the immigration law enforcement initiatives that were undertaken by Attorney General Ashcroft with the FBI and at times with other cabinet departments to try to disrupt terrorist activities using immigration laws after 9-11. That material is available in our staff statements. And with that, we conclude. Yeah, well, look, ladies and gentlemen, I close by saying that even with the commission even stating it, that there was an overwhelming amount of intelligence reports, threat reports about threat to civil aviation, that this information was not acted upon. And there's part of the cover-up. Now, who knows what Israel or Saudi Arabia collected? We don't know. And it's very little information, very little regarding Israel for the exception of the Gerald Shea memo. With the Saudis, it's a little bit more. But the State Department is still covering up for them. Which confuses me because why do you people even vote if this is the case? If they're willing to do this to the loved ones of those killed on September 11th, what do they think of you? All right? So there's enough here and now, with the amount of information that we have 19 years later, we have enough to warrant a new investigation with the new information that we have on top of the information revealed by the commissions, which shows that domestic and foreign intelligence were inside the United States and monitoring the planes operations uh, inside the United States, the, the people that were involved with the planes operation. It's not theory anymore. This is a fact. And we, we have to stop with these silly theories and we have to stop the media cover-up and get responsible investigators to bring attention to the public about what is being covered up and what is being spread as misinformation on purpose, it seems. All right, guys. Thank you for watching. 
See you in the next video.